Let's get started. Uh, well, thank you again to everybody for joining our session today. My name is Andrew Westlin. I am a financial planner with Betterment. Uh, I am joined by Steve Lockshin, founder and principal of Advice Period, co-founder of Vanilla. And today we are really excited to talk through estate planning 101. Uh, we are going to run through some questions about why estate planning is valuable for you with your clients, uh, how you can use it to become a differentiator in the space, uh, and also how you can use it to grow your practice. So Steve's going to share some great insights with us today. Uh, and so Steve, without further ado, let's get started. I'm going to throw you a question uh, right off the bat that maybe just boils down this entire session into your answer that you give here. But who needs to create an estate plan and who needs estate planning documents? Great question. Um, everybody who's got money or a family, I mean, which is pretty much anybody who's a financial advisory client. Um, if you've got kids or a spouse, um, particularly kids, the estate plan is important just to make sure you know who's going to take care of them. And, uh, and if you've got money, keeping things out of probate uh, and making sure your money ends up where you want it to end up. Uh, are, are probably the main reason. So I'd say any any advisory client needs to have an estate plan and those estate plans need to be updated probably no less than every five years. And I'm sure we'll talk more about that as we get through this. Absolutely. All right. So we figured out who needs an estate plan, who needs documents. So why is this so important to advisors today, right? I think you and I have chatted before about how investing has been commoditized to a certain extent and clients generally expect more than just investment guidance and management where there's so much more education available and services available to, to help them out with that. Why is education on or estate planning so valuable to advisors and their firms? Yeah, I mean, let's, let's break the universe down into two groups. The folks that are still selling I can come up with a better asset allocation and I can get you into better investments. So let's call that the, the active camp to some, some uh, sort. And then everybody else and the, and the world's trending towards the everybody else and the robo advisors like Betterment help create this commoditization of uh, the industry. But, you know, if you look at the data, it says one, it's very difficult to beat the markets. And two, while the majority of value theoretically comes from asset allocation, everybody's using the same mean variance optimization models. In fact, when you boil it all the way down, the real question long term is how much do I have in risk assets and how much do I have in low risk assets? So if everyone's effectively delivering the same thing, then by definition, it's a commodity. What we've seen in the last five years is advisors start to add value through planning and really, really see a push towards more financial planning. And so the growth of financial planning software has been amazing in the last five, 10 years. Um, we think kind of the, the last frontier is estate planning. Um, most folks stay away from it because they don't get paid to do it because they don't understand it. They're not comfortable with it. And hopefully what we can do today is make it a little more comfortable and help advisors understand they don't have to become experts in estate planning to add value in estate planning. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, you're just getting at where you can be a differentiator and how this is applicable to so many more clients and folks out there. I was just reading a great blog post on the vanilla blog uh, that was published earlier this week. And according to a survey, this was cited in, uh, in the post by caring.com, 2021 marks the first year that adults aged 18 to 34 are more likely to have a will than those aged 35 to 54. So to me, that tells me one, the pandemic has probably caused a lot more folks in general to think about their estate plan, but also clearly shows that more and more clients are gonna seek this level of guidance. Uh, and as a financial planner, we all have an opportunity to show value to a lot more of our client base, especially those who maybe haven't thought about estate planning in the past. So. Steve, have you seen that sort of uptick at your firm or with clients that you're working with? And, and how have you handled that? I'd like to say we haven't seen the uptick because we're already making sure the clients have that. But but the one other thing I, when I hear that data that um, I think about is the fact that 
not only the pandemic probably pushed more people to do it, but technology enabled more people to do it. So you see things like trust and will and free will, and there's a ton of solutions out there. And we created one for advisors, um, but enabling folks to do this. And it doesn't take long to do your will online if you do nothing else. Um, and so I am not surprised if folks chatting with each other, whether it's direct or social media or whatever, saying, hey, did you do your will? Andrew, if you didn't, oh, here, I'll send you a link. Do it. It's real quick. It's really important. I just read, you know, five blogs that told me why it made sense. To your point, it means advisors need to pay attention to this because their clients are, and if it's not their clients, it's their clients' kids or the clients that they'll have in a year or five years or 10 years. But to our earlier, your first question, everybody needs it if you've got money. And if you're an advisory client, you probably got money, you got a family. And so advisors need to be up on this topic. Great. So we talked a little bit uh, at the top of who needs it, uh, like basically why, why this is so valuable. But let's dive in a little bit uh, into the weeds there. So you know, why does estate planning matter to clients? What is the main objective outside of just, you know, again, directly making sure that uh, your beneficiaries get what you want them to have? What are some of the other things and value that having an estate plan provides? Well, let's go back to the kids. Um, you know, hopefully lots of the clients or the advisors who are listening are younger and have kids and you know I'm, I'm my kids are just out of the house but they're still single so i still feel obviously responsible for them they don't need to uh be sent to a guardian since they're adults um but i cannot tell you how many people i meet that have young kids and don't have a will or revocable trust and what i tell everyone I'm like hey, you know what it's cool don't worry about it. you don't need a plan for your kids because the state has one um, so a couple of weeks in foster care, and then they'll end up wherever they probably should end up anyway. And immediately people are like, oh, I, I probably should do this. So I'd say the number one reason is if you have minor children, you want them to go to the right guardian. You want to make sure that they're not going, if your family members live across the country, that they're not being uprooted uh, from the neighborhood if they if there's someone more appropriate there to become guardians for the kids or they're a junior in high school and they want to finish out their senior year, why wouldn't you want one of the really close friends that live around there so they don't have to move someplace else? So guardianship to me is one of the really important reasons. From an economic standpoint, it's the financial reasons that you alluded to. And not only is there a cost for probate, it's public. So all that information's out there. And if you don't even care about the, the public information, what you probably should hear about the cost and the hassle. So being named a trustee or an executor is not fun when you have to deal with someone's estate. It's a burden. That's why it's usually family members that do it. Um, but making sure that you unburden those folks from having to run through probate and having to be the, uh, I mean, they'll still have to be the executor, but having to deal with all the hassle, that can be accomplished through your revocable trust. Um, and if nothing else, have a will. I mean, a will still will accomplish a lot, won't keep it out of probate, but it'll take care of key things that are important to you. Yeah, absolutely. What are some other, you know, if we're talking about building an estate plan from scratch, what are some of the other documents that uh, you think could be really valuable, especially if we're talking about somebody who's, you know, maybe just focused on minor children, maybe they're not at, you know, a certain asset level uh, where some of the more complex trust planning uh, might come into play. What are some other basic documents that you think uh, could be a real value add? I'd say will first, revocable trust probably second, but equally as important to those are your healthcare and financial powers. The financial powers you can deal with, right? If, if you have to go through some process to get access to your, unfortunately, deceased spouses or child's accounts, you can deal with that. It's unnecessary because one piece of paper can fix that. But healthcare is important. And it's funny, until we created the software, and as much as I think about estate planning, I didn't think about the fact that I've got a kid in college and he plays sports. Well, what if he got injured? He's in New Jersey. I live in California. Um, I need a HIPAA release. I need healthcare powers. I need financial powers if we need to do stuff. And so even just having those basic documents for a parent is really important for children that may not have any 
money or or children of their own, um, but who you still have to make decisions for. Because when they're 18 years old, they're protected by the law when it comes to things like HIPAA and medical decisions. Um, so I'd say those are equally as important as your will and your revocable trust. Yeah, absolutely. So I think a lot of times what I hear from colleagues, other advisors in the space is they, they want to provide this value. They know that it's important, but have a hard time getting started. Maybe their firm doesn't provide this level of service or they don't have resources. Maybe they're unsure about how much guidance do I provide? Am I here to be an educator? Am I here to provide specific guidance on what sort of documents each client of mine might need? What do you think is the best way to kind of start this process if you're not doing it today? And what is really the role of the advisor when it comes to estate planning? Um, the, the answer to the last question about the role is going to be it depends. Um, I think we have a fiduciary obligation to help our clients be aware of things that they may not be aware of, but should be aware of. Um, it can be as simple as a checklist. Do you have these documents? There's so much information on the internet. There's uh, so much information that gets circulated that we send out as an example that you all send out explaining why these things are important. Then an advisor can share that information without having to even create anything and just highlight some of the key points we made already. But I do think it's important that advisors know they don't have to become experts. They just need to know enough to make sure the client goes to the right place and follows through. If you want to take it to the next level, I, I mentioned before we went live that even in our shop where we're very focused on planning and estate planning, I talked to one of our top advisors and said, have you made sure that every one of your clients has an estate plan? They're like, yep, 100 percent. So I went into box and checked. And sure enough, you know, I spot checked and every client had their documents in there. So then I asked the advisor, are they any good? And he said, I have no idea. And so that's really the next level is, do you know if the documents are good or not good? Well, there are certain things that you can check off. How old are they? If they're more than five years, they probably need a review. If you've had life changes, you got married, you got divorced, you had a death or a birth, those are things that probably would spark uh, a review. And if you want to take it even to the next level, there are tools like ones that we created with Vanilla where people can upload the documents and somebody else will do the review and draw you a nice picture and show you where everything is so you can identify opportunities for the client. If nothing else, just make sure they go to somebody that does a good job, that is a qualified estate planner, a lawyer, um, and they can help them knock out the key documents that they need to, to either update or have in the first place. Yeah. So what I'm hearing, right? Education uh, as an advisor is most important. Educate your clients on how an estate plan fits in with their financial plan, the value that it can add both in carrying out their wishes, but also from an economic and financial standpoint. We don't need to create that plan. There's various levels that we can go to, but just at a, as a basic fiduciary role and responsibility, we need to be educated on yep. these topics. Uh, so you mentioned some of those quick wins, I would call them, as far as what we can do, again, especially if you're not an attorney and drafting these sort of documents. You mentioned the date. What are some other quick wins that we could look at when reviewing some of these documents to know whether updates are, are necessary? Uh, what state the document was created in? So everybody's mobile these days um, and picks up and moves from one state to another state. Your documents should be updated so they're contemporary with the state you live in, particularly if you go from a community property state to a non-community property state or vice versa. Um, those, those are easy. There's changing tax law. New York just changed their, um, their, I believe their healthcare directive. And so updating, that's not tax law. That was more just probate stuff, but updating your healthcare documents if you need to. So as an advisor, it should be part of your annual checklist with the client to say, did we do this? When's the last time we went over it? Confirming, are your fiduciary still who you would like them to be? So let, in other words, your, your trustees. So Andrew, you and I may have been old buddies from a while ago, and I had you as a trustee, but I haven't looked at my documents in 10 years, and I probably haven't talked to you in eight years. And it turns out you're not the right person to be my trustee. That's something that you can update in there. Um, what if your 
um, other fiduciaries, your healthcare and financial powers uh, folks are deceased or you're not in touch with them. So it's just worth always checking to make sure your emergency um, power holders are can up to date with your changing situations. Great. So I, I want to talk a little bit more just about deepening the relationship with your clients, right? I think you've already provided some great insight into the value of this, why it's so important, but let's talk about more on a, a client level. So a couple of things that I always run through uh, when I'm working with clients and we're talking about this for the first time. So how high of a priority is this? And I, I don't necessarily mean as far as importance. We've already established that this is incredibly important. But when do you start this planning? Let's say with a, a prospective client, uh, it certainly can be a differentiator for you and your firm in the exploratory phase when you're prospecting with someone. Uh, but what should advisor focus on first if you're not only building an estate plan from scratch, but also a financial plan from scratch, where does this estate planning fit into the order of all the other things that we need to do? I, I think it's foundational. I, I think it should be one of the first things that you do. The other thing it does is it builds intimacy with the client. So if somebody's truly transparent about their estate plan, particularly if they've built up some real net worth, then you know. Um, who they love, because you know who the beneficiaries are, you know, their relationship with money, how they think about money, because you see how they, what the dispositive terms are of the trusts. You might know something about their health because they were going to disclose that if they've got some issues and they're concerned about guardianship and things of that nature. Um, and you know their finances because that weighs into that. So instead of pitching them on, give me some portion of your money so I can invest it, it's trust me as your advisor to make sure that your entire plan is set up properly. And then I'm looking out for not just you, but for your family. When you get to folks who have uh, money that's above the estate tax exemption, um, which is 11.7 million now per person, but is gonna go down to about 6 million in 2026, if not earlier than that, every dollar that you move out of their estate saves 40 cents. And it's not just that first 40 cents, but it's all the compounding of that money afterwards. And so if you look at my practice where I deal predominantly with taxable estates, clients with, with taxable estates, I spend 80% of my time on their estate plan and how to, to move money out of their estate. Because where can you get a 40% instant return without any portfolio risk? Nowhere except in estate planning. And so not only do I accomplish that for them, but it provides that intimacy that I mentioned earlier uh, and really builds nice, long lasting relationships with the clients. Yes. When you put dollars and cents to it like that, it, you generally get uh, some pretty wide eyes. But clients are oftentimes apprehensive to start these discussions, right? They can be uncomfortable. How do you broach that topic for the first time with a client? And when do you bring into the fold family members, right? That's so important when discussing estate planning is not just with the client and their spouse, but with children, their heirs. Uh, how do you broach and start that conversation? Well, to the, the first part about how is you just have to ask questions. Um, it can't be something as broad as like, would you like to cover your estate plan? It's have you provided for this? Have you thought about this? I will usually ask people, what's the size of your total estate? Um, and that will kind of put them in category A or B. A, we need to spend a lot of time focusing on their estate plan because that's going to be a big returner in terms of uh, net value for the family, or B, they don't have a taxable estate, and I just need to make sure it's part of the foundation and they've thought through things. But either way, as you ask questions about their family members and the relationship with money, and I always ask people, what is the money for? What do you want to happen at the end of the rainbow? The, the questions get out of math and into emotion. And again, that's how you build a relationship um, with that client. When it comes to bringing in their family members, it's, it's very uh, unique to each family. Um, most families don't do it until they're, they've built some significant wealth and it's important if they really have a deep multi-generational estate plan to get the heirs involved. Um, but, you know, the old adage shirt sleeves, the shirt sleeves in three generations is a function of people not passing their 
thought process around money down. And so usually one generation builds it, one generation spends it, and the other generation has to start over again. But if you put the right processes in place, and if you explain people's philosophy and you make sure it's built into their plan, then those that have multi-generational wealth can make sure that their their legacy effectively lasts. So I want I want to make sure there's schooling for all my heirs forever. That's a tenant of my plan. It's built in. And when I talk to my kids, I talk about that. And when I learn something from a family, we make sure we talk about it with their kids. The other part that relates to this, not to run on too long, is the data says when one parent dies, two thirds of the um, uh, families fire the advisor. And when both parents die, it's 98%. <clears throat> well, building that relationship with kids helps retain that business. Um, because now you're not the parent's advisor anymore. You're the family's advisor. And so being able to have those uh, discussions um, with their kids, particularly if you have a wealthy client, making sure they've taken care of their core docs starts to build that relationship. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about sales, right? And how you fit this into your practice. Uh, You know, you mentioned at the start of, of this that some advisors and some of the folks probably on this call are maybe already providing some of these services, but don't know how to charge for them or aren't charging for them. How do you make this clear in the prospecting uh, process and let a client know that this is going to be part of the value that you provide? Uh, and how do you make sure that your firm is, is compensated for that? Uh, every advisor is going to figure out what schema they want to use for billing. Um, I happen to favor one that's a fixed fee and it identifies the services that we're going to provide. And so once we say you're paying for this, there's an expectation. I think what I tend to see in the industry is a lot of folks will have on their website, we do this, 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 and this, and the state planning is one of them, but they only charge assets on assets under management. Well, if you only get paid on assets under management, what do you spend your time on? Gathering assets under management. So whether it's a separate fee, whether there's a planning fee, whether your total fee is fixed, um, somehow I would encourage you to include estate planning as part of it and as part of an identifiable fee to almost even say, if you don't use that service, we will charge you less. And I'll give you an example on our fees. If someone's using Betterment because it's it's a robo that you know on our platform, we charge them 10% less because we have less work to do. The system does the work for us. If they're not using the estate planning services, we'll charge them less because there's less work for us to do. That kind of forces us to do the work and pay attention to the things that need to have attention paid to them. Um, And so that's why I encourage folks to have a separate line item for the the planning. Yeah. So your fee explicitly expresses the value you're going to provide, right? So if you're going to be an investment uh, advisor and, and guidance solely related to investments charge that AUM fee. But being able to show the value in estate planning, among others, right, there's maybe more clear, transparent ways to do so. Uh, all right. So we've talked about a bunch so far. And I'll, I'll just stop here and say we've gotten a couple of questions come through the chat. For anybody who does have questions, feel free to send those through. We'll get to those in, in just a couple of minutes here. Uh, but since I just got us sidetracked a little bit, Steve, how can I implement this at scale with my clients or for any of the planners on this call, how can you implement this at scale? I mean, everything I think when you talk about scale comes down to process. Um, I mentioned to you earlier, if, if, an, if an advisor has 100 clients and let's just assume they're a great advisor and all 100 clients have a plan, they probably have somewhere around 50 different attorneys they're dealing with because clients come with their own or the advisors, you know, got multiple folks they work with. Often I hear discussions about, well, the, these are where I get referrals. So yeah, I'm going to have a whole bunch of folks that I work with. Um, understanding what the is in the plans is really important. Having a common set of diagrams. I know if I log into Betterment, I know exactly where to find my asset mix. I know where to find my statements. I know where to find anything I need because it's a consistent experience every time, how do I create that with the estate planning? So again, not to be an advertisement for vanilla, but that was one of the things that we thought about. 
Let's give advisors the ability to upload all their clients, send over the documents, and then they get back a consistent looking document around what the plan looks like and identification of things that are missing so that they can have the simple conversation become knowledgeable about topics that seem to arise uh, more and more frequently. So that's how I think you do it at scale. Um, and then I mentioned earlier having an annual checklist or whatever periodic uh, checklist you're going to use to make sure you're going through that and asking these these questions so that it just doesn't fall by the wayside. Yep. So with that checklist, what other data can planners gather ahead of time uh, as we're going through this uh, like exploration phase or if we're using a service like Vanilla, what can an advisor do to expedite that process? I would say always in your first meeting, get copies of every document because that's when you'll find out how old they are, are they in the right state, you know, basic things that will identify opportunities. Um, and you'll, you'll be amazed, absolutely amazed at how many people don't have documents. Um, so that, that to me would be the first place to start. From there, I would ask questions about their family members and what is their relationship with money and what do they want to happen at the end of the rainbow? Those soft questions that really deepen the relationship. Um, those are things that will help um, the advisor do a better job when it comes to planning. Great. So I have one more for you before we get into some of the uh, the questions from the attendees here. Uh, but look, I've gotten buy-in now, right? I've expressed how valuable an estate plan can be for, for a client or a group of clients. They're bought in. They want to start this. How can I pitch Vanilla as a differentiator, as new, better, or different from their current plan, or as a great place to start if they've never created an estate plan before? So one of the things that drove us nuts and one of the solutions we provide in Vanilla is, the, is document creation. Um, it drove me nuts that to go to a high quality firm, we had to spend 5,000 at a minimum, usually eight to 12,000, sometimes more just to get a core set of documents. One, that's out of reach for a lot of folks. Um, and two, it just seems unnecessarily high for what is really the same document over and over. And, the, and what drives the price up is the fact that most law firms just are running antiquated software or they're just taking a Word doc and updating it and spending all the time reading it. So the process of asking questions, collecting the data and creating the documents and automated the whole thing. So the process that, that Vanilla has really set up is if you become a client of mine, I can ask you those initial questions. I can upload your documents a set of recommendations and that chart comes back and tells me what needs to happen. If you don't have documents or your document needs to be updated, I can send you a link. You can do the whole thing yourself. It connects you with an attorney that's approved on the system. It's done over video and then the documents are ready. And this all can be done very, very quickly. So what an advisor gets is everything in one place, an ecosystem where they can have all their clients, and now the system starts to remind them, hey, it's been a year since Andrew did his documents. Let's make sure his fiduciaries are still correct. Or Andrew's son just turned 18 or is about to turn 18. You should get those three, the healthcare, financial, and HIPAA release done for, for his son. Um, and all the other changes to tax law. Or we notice Andrew just moved from New York to California. He needs new documents. So all of that stuff basically gets automated makes the advisor look great because the system's doing the work for them. And unlike most planning software where you have to go in and get the information, this is pushing the information to you so you know what to do. Yeah, it creates that visual, right? That advisors gives you so much more to work with, whether you're using this behind the scenes directly with clients and, and having everything in one place, there's just, it's invaluable, right? To your practice, especially as, we get back to scalability uh, and really implementing this across your broader organizations. Uh, so really, really helpful. Uh, Steve, I know that we've crossed over the uh, the half hour mark and we've gone through a bunch so far. We did get uh, a few specific questions in here that maybe we could tackle uh, and then wrap up for, uh, for the afternoon. So uh, I'll start with one here. So when thinking about vanilla as an estate planning tool, 
Is there an upper limit in terms of high net worth households where vanilla is no longer adequate? Uh, to follow up with that, what's the size of an estate when we should consider bringing in outside estate planning attorneys? So the, the product originally was designed for the ultra affluent. So the, the, the backstory is when we started focusing predominantly on estate planning, if I moved a hundred million out of someone's estate, when they saw their balance sheet, they still see the big number at the bottom. It didn't identify the value that was created. So we created a balance sheet that identified things that we thought were important, their asset mix, not by large cap, small cap, but by commercial real estate versus personal real estate or vested or unvested options, things like that. Then what's liquid, illiquid, and then what's in my estate or out of my estate. And on that piece, we would roll forward to age 95 and show them at a 5% growth how much their tax bill would be and how much they'd saved. And very quickly, folks went to look at that and go, why aren't we doing more of that? That's that's Those are big numbers. And we wanted to automate that. And so that's really designed for folks that have, you know, mega estates. Let's call it, you know, 30 million plus today, but really up into the billions. Um, and so that was the genesis of the product. And that's what the ultra offering that's being rolled out now has in it. Very deep um, balance sheet. So you can see not just what's in their estate or out of their state, but is it a generation skipping trust or not? Does, is there an inclusion ratio, which creates complexity? What are the dispositive terms so you can see who all of the beneficiaries are and what they get and when? So that's the answer to how big can you go? Really, this is designed for somebody who has nothing all the way up to somebody who's got a ton. In terms of bringing in a, an outside expert, I mean, the attorneys that we hire are certainly capable, but when you get to the, you know, kind of upper levels, I'd say you want to bring in specialists that are used to dealing with complex estates, particularly if they've got certain unique aspects. You know, there are special rules around folks who run private equity versus, you know, if have a carried interest versus someone who's got their own business. Um, so I'd say north of 30 million, I'd probably start looking at, uh, you know, bringing in other counsel in addition to the folks that we have because they're designed predominantly to cover all the basics so somebody can knock out documents effectively and efficiently. Great. Uh, so another question here, do you recommend advisors or planners? Uh, so maybe even at advice period or, or the advisors on, on your uh, on your team, do you recommend keeping vanilla behind the scenes to clients or being upfront uh, about you know, outsourcing this service and really using some of the visual aids that Vanilla does such a great job of, of showing to an advisor? Well, first of all, everything's white labeled, so it's going to have the advisor's logo. That being said, I'm all about transparency. So I have no problem telling folks I use this software for this and I use that software for that. Um, I think it demonstrates that we're trying to create leverage, um, but that's going to be advisor's choice. Um, I, I will never get in the way of somebody telling somebody the truth and being transparent. Not that not telling them isn't the truth, um, but it kind of highlights like, I don't need to be an expert. I'm going to run your stuff through this software and it's going to tell us if it's needs updating or not. And then I'll present it to you, but I'm not claiming that I'm an estate planning attorney. I'm just using the software to help identify things you might want to talk about with an estate planning attorney. Yeah. Gets back to, right, the investment uh, planning becoming commoditized. Uh, do I necessarily need to come up with a unique asset class recommendation uh, or portfolio breakdown when I can use services that are gonna do all that heavy lifting for me, right? So there's a couple questions here that are more specific to vanilla and the product. You okay if we go through a couple of those? Sure. Great. Uh, so first question I have here is when will more states get added to core? So et cetera, or for example, Ohio uh, or Virginia, just more states that are being offered into the core platform. It, it's a chicken and egg thing uh, to a certain extent. So as we have more demand, we bring on attorneys in those states. It's uh, turned out to be way more work than we thought to find, not just attorneys, but attorneys that we think are up to snuff uh, and who don't feel like they're going to be put out of business by software. So we, some folks are a little bit protectionist, um, but we're going to keep adding states and we've been adding. I know a couple are coming out in the next few weeks. I was asking about them yesterday. So I'd say keep checking back and sign up for updates. Um, but 
if you have a state where you need something and you know you're going to have more than five in a relatively short period, send an email to the team and, and we'll put that to the top of the list. Great. A uh, couple questions here just about pricing for vanilla. So how is it priced and what's the cost on a per advisor basis? So we have two pricing models. Um, for a smaller advisor, it's per seat. It's $3,000 for the basic per year and 6000 for the ultra. Um, you get to upload five uh, client sets of documents per month, so it doesn't swamp the system. You can upload all your clients, but just have the five reviewed uh, per, per month. Um, and then for larger firms, we actually have a token system where the firm can buy a set of tokens and then that covers reports um, and they can do them as quickly or slowly as they want based on the number of tokens that they bought. Um, the other thing is all the documents are paid for by the client. So the advisor doesn't pay anything for that. Um, the client pays for it. It's way less expensive than if they went to an attorney to do it and far more efficient. And there is an attorney involved. So I should say went to, I mean, physically goes versus versus online. Um, but those are those are the two pricing models uh, that we've got today. So I think it only takes one client per year to pay for the whole thing. Um, but advisors will be the judge of that. Great. Uh, and just as far as pricing goes, obviously, like you just went through, it's going to determine or be determined by your firm, clients, et cetera. Uh, one thing I, I will add is that for any planners out there that are using the Betterment for Advisors platform, uh, there will be some sort of promotion from Vanilla uh, about services. So we'll be sending out some additional information later on. I just wanted to share that since we did get quite a few questions around pricing. Uh, so, Steve, uh, I've learned a ton. Uh, I think we can all say and walk away from our session today that estate planning is so much more prevalent and valuable to such a larger subset of our clients today. Uh, and look, if you believe that there's technology that's better for investing in financial planning software and services like uh, Betterman or a number of other robo advisors that are out there, then I think safe to say that you should believe in something like vanilla uh, where you can provide estate planning at scale. That's my main takeaway. Anything that you want the, uh, the audience to walk away from our time together today with? I, I think we hit on most of it. And that is, you know, if you're going to call yourself an advisor, advise on everything. Otherwise to me, you're just an investment manager. And I think we all strive to be advisors and estate planning is a fundamental piece of anyone's uh, net worth and family. And so I encourage everybody to up their game when it comes to estate planning. Fantastic. Uh, well, thank you everybody for joining today. Uh, there's, we're looking at doing a, a series here. So look out for more information on additional sessions uh, that Steve will lead. Uh, Steve, thank you for your time this afternoon. I'm uh, glad we're able to talk through everything. I uh, look forward to chatting again in the future and hope everybody has a, a great rest of their afternoon. Same. Thanks for the time.